one. Hello, welcome everyone uh, to our event today from local to global saving animals and humans across the globe in international disasters. I'm delighted to um, be welcoming you as director of the Global Research Network. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization running um, a, a think tank. Well, it's a member run think tank with hundreds of researchers from around the world who come together to collaborate on projects that have real, real social impact. Um, the programs we run are available on our website. It's www.grn.global. If you have any interest in joining, do have a look at the projects that we've been running and the events, such as this wonderful one that we're hosting today, and consider joining up. Uh, I'll hand over now to Altamur Said, who's the coordinator of this and facilitating our discussion today. And welcome, um, get, get a cup of coffee, and we look forward to hearing all the speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Automo. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Altamir Said. I'm a junior fellow at the Animals and Biodiversity Think Tank at the Global Research Network. And I welcome all of you to this event titled From Local to Global Saving Animals and Humans Across the Globe in International Disasters. The idea behind this event is uh, we are originally planning to have more of these expert panel discussions uh, over this topic on a, on every every year actually. And uh, just to begin and give you a background about the event, uh, and because we are approaching this uh, this event and other future events from actually from a point of view of questions, and the main area that we are more very interested in knowing more about is is what are disasters are they natural like if they can be predicted and therefore we can prepare how much duty do we have to prevent them or at least exponentially reduce the risk if they are not natural but are rather caused by anthropocentric factors such as factory farming can the harm in a disaster be reduced through rescue and capacity building also, how should we frame a disaster protection frameworks that devoid that is devoid of anthropocentrism, where humans and animals needs are equally met in disasters? What should our solutions be? Is it an animal specific protection matrix to an international treaty or what else? Uh, so I'm approaching this uh, expert panel fr from a lot of questions. And whenever I was, you know, trying to write the background about this event, I actually wanted to mention the recent disaster that had happened. And unfortunately, uh, there have been four disasters uh, in September alone and one now in October. And to just give you a short background or a brief of why conversations like these are really important is I want to mention to the people about the major disaster that happened in February and March, uh, which was a, an earthquake of a 7.8 magnitude in Turkey, which led to the death of 51,000 humans. Unfortunately, since there was no policy for recording animal deaths, we don't know how many animals died in that event. Uh, then there were the Canada wildfires, which basically led to the burning of over 27.1 million acres of land uh, just in this year. And they were over at, at a certain point in July, around 600 active fires happening. And then, unfortunately, there were these Maui, Hawaii wildfires, which actually uh, have been one of the major ones. And since 2000, the U.S. unfortunately has had over 72,400 wildfires. And these fires have burned an average of 7 million acres of land annually, twice as much as was annually burned during the 1990s. Uh, to move forward, uh, another disaster that happened in September alone was the Libya floods. And these happened due to a dam collapse. And because there were no um, warning systems available to guide the people away from these disaster, this disaster could actually have been prevented. And it led to uh, an unfortunate death of 11,300 people. And again, we have no data of how many animals did, did, died because there is no such policy for that. Uh, lastly, in September 8, there was another earthquake in Morocco, uh, which led to the deaths of 2,900 people. And uh, unfortunately, in October, on October 7, there was another earthquake in Afghanistan which led to the to the deaths of 2,000 people and hurt over 1,200 people and led to the destruction of uh, 1,300 houses. 
this is just in 2023 alone. Disasters are unfortunately not no longer uh, an event that happens annually, but it's it's monthly. And if not, uh, if we if we talk about September, then it's actually uh, a a weekly occurrence. And with this background, we basically open this panel. And again, uh, in in no order of preference, I would like to introduce our esteemed speakers today. Uh, our, our speaker from India is Varnika Singh, who is the head of legal affairs at Federation of Indian Animal Protection Organizations. She has an experience over 13 years and is a prominent figure in animal law, uh, serving as the head of legal affairs at FIAPO. She specializes in animal protection and has been actively involved in high profile litigation cases such as street dog rights, Jali Katu, and the banning of animals in circuses. She has been instrumental in related dairy management, ensuring compliance with animal welfare regulations. Her expertise extend beyond the courtroom, supporting her team in filing FIRs and providing uh, legal training. She is currently pursuing an LLM in animal law at Lewis and Clark Law School. Uh, Varnika, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, our next esteemed speaker is Beth Agustan, who is the co-founder of uh, Humanitarian Advisory Group from Australia. Beth holds a Master of Development Studies and was awarded the Humanitarian Overseas Service Medal by the Australian government in 2011. She specializes in civil military coordination and humanitarian reform, working with the UN Office for the Coordination of humanitarian affairs in Afghanistan to develop civil military guidance policy on interaction with provincial reconstruction teams. Beth co-founded Humanitarian Advisory Group, a social enterprise based in Melbourne in 2012 and still remains a director. She's a Fulbright scholar and has spent time at the US Naval War College where she undertook research with the Humanitarian Response Program. Uh, Beth, thank you so much for being here with us and sharing your knowledge. Our next esteemed speaker is Dr. Steve Blassi. Uh, who is an international award-winning emergency manager with a number of specialties, including animal disaster management. He was selected by as a subject matter expert on the topic uh, for the Oxford Research Encyclopedia and Routledge Handbook on Animal Welfare. He has an experience over 30 years uh, and has risen to positions such as Director of Training Performance and Governance at the County Fire Authority in Victoria, Australia. He's an associate professor and director at Central Queensland University and a general manager at Emergency Management and Business uh, Continuity at New Zealand's largest uh, government department, the Ministry of Social Development, uh, disaster management officer with the UN and the chief executive officer of the Emergency Management Academy of New Zealand. Uh, in 2008, he was awarded with the prestigious Certified Emergency Manager credentials and remains one of the many few in the world to have these credentials. Thank you, Dr. Steve Blassi, for joining us today. Our next esteemed speaker is Amanda Lamont, who is also from Australia and is a disaster resilience advisor, climate change storyteller, firefighter, emergency volunteer, world explorer, writer, photographer, and a public speaker with over 30 years of experience. She has held senior roles in government INGOs, not-for-profit and corporate enterprises. She is also co-founder of the Australasian Women in Emergency Networks and has uh, been involved in a variety of paid volunteer roles uh, on developing strategies and supporting people before, during, and after disasters on the front line of an escalating disaster landscape and biodiversity crisis exacerbated by climate change, Amanda's professional and personal experiences have led her to establish nature-based resilience, acting as an environmental advocate in disaster planning and igniting a movement in the connection to nature to build collective human and ecological resilience. Uh, Amanda, thank you so much for joining us today. And our, finally, our last esteemed speaker is Kelly Donathan from the US, who's the director of Humane Society International Global Animal Disaster Response Program. She holds a BS in ecology and evolutionary biology uh, from the University of Arizona and an MS in conservation medicine from Tufts Cummings School of Veterinary Medicine. She began her career as an animal care specialist at White Oak Conservation, working with a variety of endangered species. Following graduate school, she worked with the International Fund for Animal Welfare, first as a policy analyst, then as a wildlife rescue program officer. She is an alumna of class five of the Emerging Wildlife Conservation Leaders Program, during which she co-founded the Painted Dog Protection, Product Protection Initiative. In 2015, Kelly worked as the bear manager at Animals Asia Vietnam Bear Rescue Center, caring for nearly 200 
amazing bears and rescuing them from the bio trade. Returning to the U.S. in 2017, she worked as an independent consultant for wildlife conservation and animal welfare organizations while pursuing a certificate in sustainability and behavior change from the University of California. She briefly worked at World Animal Protection as their exotic pets campaign manager before joining HSI and has responded to disasters around the world, including wildfires, cyclones, earthquakes, and volcanic eruptions. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, to go about with the order presentations, in no order preference, we will be going actually with the chronological order. And I will actually offer the floor to Amanda to talk about her work and, and to share her knowledge with us. Thank you. Thank you. And have I got um, the ability to share my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, it says only the host, so can you change that? Can you give me sharing options? I don't have, it's not coming up. It, it should be all participants. Are you still unable to share? Yeah. Perhaps, do, does somebody else want to go first and then we can fix that up in the background so we don't waste time? I'm happy to do uh, that if that's helpful. Yeah, sure, we can do that. Uh, I'll offer the floor to Beth first and then we'll come back to Amanda. Thank no you. problem, Thank you, Beth. Amanda. We can, we can tick tack, it'll be all right. All right, let's see if I can share my screen here. Let's see. Mine, I've got mine now, if you want me to, okay, cool. Okay, no, 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 that's, let's go with you, Amanda. Let me just stop sharing, great. Good. Oh, good start, excellent start, everybody. It's good to get that out of the way. Now we'll be smooth silent. Yay, how are we looking, is that okay? Does that look good to everyone? Yeah, it looks perfect. Fabulous, well, let's keep moving along. Um, now, I understand this is a think tank, not a teach tank. So I'm going to start with um, a couple of ideas for us to think about throughout the course of this presentation. Um, some people are so poor, all they have is money. And when we talk about nature, environment, conservation and animals in a disaster context, I think it's really important to remember that a lot of the things that we report on, value, focus on, are not often the things that we really value when we lose them. So keep this in the back of your head as we move through this presentation. Another thing to keep in the back of your head is this can be a pretty black and dark and gloomy topic. So I always like to approach conversations around disasters and climate change with belief, curiosity and trust. Now I used to say hope, curiosity and trust, but after becoming a total Ted Lasso fan, I've decided that belief is better than hope. So now I want us to believe that anything is possible, be curious about how to do it and trust that everyone is in this for the right reasons. So let's be positive as we work through some pretty depressing concepts like this one, climate change, of course. Um, Known as the greatest existential threat of our time. You might recognize this image. It was taken in the 70s uh, from NASA. It was as they were returning to Earth. It's the first time we saw Earth all at once together. And it's said to have changed the way we think about our home, our planet, uh, realizing that we all live on this place and that we all have a responsibility to care for it and look after it as our home. Strategically placed the rotation with Australia there in the forefront, um, being a very patriotic Australian. So climate change. Look, there's a long list of things in this slide. Political instability, floods, bushfires, storms, extreme heat events, um, changing um, sea level, 
um, temperature of the ocean, wind movements and patterns. We know all of this. We know that climate change is changing the planet. It's also driving more extreme, frequent and severe disaster landscapes. Um, really interesting, the last one on that list to point out, our way of life, our way of life is potentially going to be fundamentally changed, dare I say, has changed the way that we live because of all of these things, not just the direct impacts, but the cascading and flow on consequences of climate change. So I don't know whether you've seen this before, but this really struck me, this image. Remember COVID? Remember we thought it was the biggest thing ever to we were going to experience in our lifetime. And if you can't see it there in the, in the comment bubble, be sure to wash your hands and all will be well. So we thought COVID was a big thing. But on the back of COVID, we started talking about a global financial economic recession. And this was actually going to cause us more pain, trauma and suffering. But then, of course, as COVID drifted off and the financial crisis looked like it wasn't going to peak, we now are really focused on climate change. To think about all of those things that we thought were really fundamentally life-changing and to know that the collapse of our biodiversity globally is going to be an even bigger impact on all of us over our lifetimes. And there's that comment from David Attenborough, what we do now and in the next few years will profoundly affect the next few thousand years and, dare I say, our lifetime. So biodiversity is an important part of the conversation that we have to have. We can't just keep talking about climate change in isolation around reducing greenhouse gas emissions and the impact on humans. We need to think about that beautiful blue marble planet that we all live on. Imagine this, imagine on our watch this century that we risk losing up to 50% of all land-based species. Can you believe that? That's phenomenal. That is a huge thing to comprehend. And this, interestingly, is a statistic that comes from an, economic paper, uh, an economics paper. So to think that in our lifetime, because of climate change, because of human impacts, that we could potentially lose half of land-based species that we live alongside. And we don't necessarily know the impacts of that on our lives. So we know that climate change is threatening species in multiple and complex ways. And yes, this, this talk is about animals in a disaster context, but I'm gonna specifically focus on wildlife in the environment. So we're looking at habitat loss, changing environmental thresholds. So air temperature, water getting too hot beyond which species can survive in. Changes of species interactions, they're no longer um, cross-pollinating and species aren't meeting where they normally would. Species are moving south away from the equator. How's that gonna change ecosystems and interactions? Destruction of ecosystem, loss of homes, um, direct loss of animals um, as a result of um, climate change, heat events, and of course, the direct impacts of disasters like bushfires, floods and storms. And then new species being introduced into the environment like disease, which impacts on the really complex and incredibly fragile ecosystem that we all live in. So specifically in Australia, um, we had our first mammal extinction due to climate change. As a, as a direct result of climate change, we lost the beautiful Bramble Clay Malomus, Malomus in the Great Barrier Reef. It lost its home in a tiny island in the north of Australia because of sea level rises. And then you can just see all around Australia, we are seeing the impacts of climate change uh, on our species. We see heat events knocking budgerigars out of the sky. We're seeing heating oceans, which are changing the way that the, the sea turtles in the north of Australia are breeding. Um, the hotter the water, the more likelihood it is we're going to have female turtles that are born. Imagine a future where no male turtles are born, we're all females. We lose that species. We're seeing um, mass fish deaths in the Murray-Darling Basin. We're seeing the bogong moths flight patterns changing, a uh, critical food source for the pygmy possum in the alpine range, uh, ranges. They go extinct. We're seeing the alpine zone, lo zone losing its snow. So we we're seeing all around Australia, on land and off land, changes in climate, changing the way that these species interact and are able to live. So here's just some specific examples. Warming temperatures impact our beautiful platypus. I talked about the sea turtles. 99% of young green sea turtles are now female. Um, the bats fall out of the trees in the hot weather events that we have in Australia. And of course, koalas not only suffering directly through bushfires, but really struggling in the heat. And you go on reasonably mild days to zoos now and you see that always the sprinklers are on cooling down the koalas because they have a low tolerance to heat. Now, I probably don't need to tell you about the disasters in Australia. Here's just an example of our disaster landscape in the last four years. Um, 
We get impacted by bushfires, floods and storms. We also have a wet season and a cyclone season. We've had tsunami warnings, warnings, we've had earthquakes. So all of these things are impacting on us in Australia. And if you saw the timeline of these events throughout the year, these events more and more are overlapping. And can I just mention that in the last couple of weeks, we had bushfires here in Victoria. And the very next day, those same areas that were under bushfire threat were under flood alert. So one day we had the, the bushfire map indicating where homes were, and property was potentially going to be lost. And the very next day, those areas were under flood. When we talked about cascading events, we never really imagined it was going to be the very next day. So we are really suffering the extremes of temperature. And it's really not um, much of a stretch of the imagination to see the impacts this is going to have, yes, on people, but also on wildlife. And also just to mention livestock and pets are really key part of our emergency management landscape. But as I said, I'm going to focus on wildlife. So here are some um, comments made in our um, Royal Commission into the National Natural Disasters um, following the 2019 and 20 bushfires in Australia, which I'm sure you're aware of. Did you know that we have really unique species in Australia? Seven to 10% of the species here in Australia are not found anywhere else on earth. So this is something we really need to value here in Australia. Remember, some people are so poor, all they have is money. What do we really value? So our ecosystems are under increasing strain because of the, the disaster landscape brought, upon, brought about by climate change. So this ecological disaster that we saw in 2019 and 20, you can see the statistics at the top of the screen. Billions of reptiles, millions of birds and mammals and frogs that lived in those areas that were impacted by those bushfires. And I haven't written this down, it might be anecdotal. It's anecdotal because we don't really know about invertebrates. But one of our experts in Australia has suggested that potentially 30% of invertebrates in the southeast of Victoria went extinct during those bushfires. So this really is a crisis of an um, astronomical scale res with respect to our ecosystem and our biodiversity. So in my journey in emergency management, I've had lots of different roles. I've worked mainly with people at national, state and local level and at the grassroots. Um, after the bushfires, I actually got a really interesting role at Zoos Victoria as the Climate Action Disaster Resilience Advisor. And my job there was to support Zoos Victoria in their planning um, in response to those bushfires. So there was a lot of stuff that happened with wildlife and there wasn't necessarily a plan, but actually, um, the organisations like zoos and, and wildlife welfare organisations rallied really well and did some phenomenal things. And I want to talk about the Eastern Bristlebird extraction. There are 800 um, of these species that are existing in this um, fire footprint area, half of them in Victoria and half across the border in New South Wales. It just so happened that one day a woman was in the office, saw the fire footprint and realised that a critical population of those birds um, that were on the extinction list were in the path of the bushfire. Some phone calls were made and everyone rallied together in, in, this, in a very short space of time, permits were issued and a crew was dropped into the, into the front of the fire zone um, and they were able to collect 15 of those birds in a couple of days before they had to, to move out because the fire was approaching. We had the Defence Force and the Fisheries Department and those birds were relocated to Zoos Victoria where they were looked after until they could be returned back into their home in that population. So when we talk about evacuation, we often think about people, but to understand that there is some really concerted efforts now going into evacuation of threatened species that are in the, in the path of these um, disasters and bushfires. Phenomenal effort, but it was sort of by chance. So a lot of work in the background now is to put plans in place to make sure that we don't helicopter people in at the last minute, that we actually have plans to make sure that we protect in place, evacuate out, or make sure that we have insurance populations. And you will have seen this on the news, but there was an incredible amount of work in the animal triage uh, and koala care. So looking after the koalas that were impacted in those bushfires, rehabilitating them sometimes up to 12 months and returning them. So what Zoos Victoria saw was that their role in disasters was really important working alongside partners to ensure that threatened species didn't go ex extinct as a result of a disaster after 20 years of work of trying to protect them from extinction. And really importantly, that people were trained um, in the future for the wildlife disasters. So um, zoos, as I said, seeing a lot more of their role that they have to play. The Zoos Victoria has a really strong statement on climate change, not only as an organisation, but really rallying resources around its threatened species program, protection of habitat, 
and ensuring the welfare of wildlife, both in properties and in the wildlife. Um, I was um, authored the Zoos Victoria Wildlife Emergency Management Arrangements. So now Zoos Victoria has a really um, substantial document which outlines its arrangements of how it will um, mobilise and respond in the face of future disasters. And really important there was understanding the impacts of climate change on the disaster landscape. So in our Royal Commission, um, some findings were found with respect to animals generally and specific wildlife. In Australia, wildlife are managed by um, national, state and local governments. And the recommendations were that we need, really needed to consolidate and integrate some of our legislation so that they spoke to each other more easily. That we needed to do some training, particularly around spontaneous volunteers and people that want to go and help wildlife and also train emergency service responders who don't necessarily know best care and management of wildlife in disasters. Um, and really importantly, um, greater consistency and collaboration on the collection of data about the critical species in Australian flora and fauna. So this is a think, not a teach, but there are a lot of resources that you can find really easily about how the emergency management landscape is managed in Australia, particularly with respect to animals and wildlife. So really quickly to finish up, I feel like there was a bit of a gap when I moved from a people-focused um, disaster response and resilience role into an environmental role. And I realised that we weren't prioritising um, the environment and animals enough in our emergency management plans. Here's an example in Victoria of our state emergency management priorities. Yay, we're on the list. Protection of environment and conservation assets. Boo, we're last on the list. But what I say to people, it's not either life and relief to suffering or animals. My advocacy point and my pitch is that we can do all of these things. We are smart enough and we don't have to choose. So we are on the list with respect to animals and the environment. So we have a responsibility to protect them all in our planning. And there's a lot more we can do. So we tend to think of ourselves as humans at the top of the apex, above all the other species, in control of everything, and we come first. I'd like us to reimagine where we sit in our ecosystem. This is their model, and I've suggested maybe they want to adapt the model to include value, because we don't know what the risk is until we understand what we value, and I believe that we should be putting more value on wildlife, the environment, our ecosystems and biodiversity. It's in the Sustainable Development Goals. We're seeing huge movements with the UNDIR towards understanding nature-based solutions and the important role of nature in protecting us. So nature-based resilience. We need to look after nature and it will look after us. It's critical. So I wish lots of things for our future and it's all about looking after each other, having the knowledge and wisdom of our ancestors and our ancient ancestors, working together, partnering, changing minds and hearts about the important role of nature, environment, wildlife and animals in our disaster planning. And don't forget belief, curiosity and trust. Thank you very much. There are my contact details. I was a little bit over, sorry. Uh, no, that was that was insightful and it was perfect. Thank you so much for the work that you do and you, the work that you will do. So thank you so much for both of those. And uh, I will now move forward in no order of preference in chronological order over to Beth. Thank you so much. I'll just get my screen working. Just to make you feel good, Amanda, that you weren't the only one who. <laughs> it's coming. Here we are. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, uh, Amanda. It's. Um, Great to hear your insights and I hope to build on a couple of those. Um, and before I begin, I wanted to touch on what Amanda just mentioned on about um, uh, our ancestors um, and wanted to acknowledge the traditional lands on which I'm joining you from tonight of the Jajawarong people uh, north of Melbourne. And the reason I wanted to bring that up in particular is to talk about, again, some of that traditional knowledge. And this is so critical when it comes to looking at the environment and protecting wildlife and, and other animals um, and really living in harmony with those when it comes to preparing for, responding to and recovering from 
disasters. Uh, in Australia, this is very well known, the fact that um, there is such a, a massively long history of more than 70,000 years of ongoing care uh, of the environment and, and knowledge of, of animals and how humans and animals live together. But, and sorry, Amanda, that I had to bring this up, but it had to be done. Um, sadly, we do not uh, value this in the way that we should, in my humble opinion. Amanda and I have just gone through a referendum this past weekend in which um, that uh, recognition of that, that knowledge and care for the land, unfortunately, has not been valued and embraced in the way that many of us would have hoped to see. So we must find other ways. Today, what I would like to talk to you about is the way in which uh, the International Disaster Response System uh, in many different contexts, uh, what that looks like, how we're responding, and also to highlight to you some of the research that we've been doing around the way in which we can green the humanitarian system, the very way in which we respond to disasters should also uh, ensure that we are treading gently on the environment and protecting animals and humans as we go. So I've got the same picture here as Amanda, <laughs> just shows how very uh, well coordinated we are. And I just wanted to, to reiterate what Amanda was saying around the impact that some of the disasters we've seen, not just in Australia, but across the world, the, the massive impact that they've had, particularly um, in, in the Black uh, Summer fires in Australia, we saw more than 3 billion animals either killed or displaced through those emergencies. So um, I wanted to, to, um, to focus on the fact that disasters, wildfires, earthquakes and others have been really catastrophic. But I also wanted to touch on a couple of other contexts. So in terms of the conflict piece, I mean, sadly, we can't even turn on the television at the moment without seeing what we are doing to each other across the globe. And I think this is a piece that we don't often hear a lot about. So this is these are all um, pictures of uh, responses uh, in Ukraine. And I think what's really interesting here is seeing um, not only the, the numbers, like thousands and thousands and thousands, of, and, and this is really looking at at, at um, animals, um, part of people's family who are being evacuated and, and moving on with different families. But the incredibly important part we have here about the role that animals have played in the psychosocial support of people as they're being displaced, as they're going through the trauma of conflict. So I think understanding how we respond to these type of crises is really important as well. And this is just a very small part, obviously that the part in terms of the, the well-being of livestock has been a huge part in terms of these type of conflicts where you've run out of power and water and, and many, many animals have been left to suffer. So that's been quite catastrophic. The pandemic, an interesting one here. Um, as you would know, during the pandemic, um, family violence was something that went through the roof. And it's been really interesting to see there was statistic in, in one particular shelter in Victoria that 53% of women who accessed that shelter said that their um, family pets had also been harmed in terms of family violence. So this is perhaps a crisis we may not uh, think of, of, of animals being um, severely impacted, but that's definitely one as well. Also one that you you may have thought about as well is that the nuclear piece. Um, this is a disaster we don't think of um, that often. However, um, it, it's something that really should be at the forefront. Um, unfortunately, the way in which certain conflicts are going, um, there is a possibility we, we may need to face this. So I think um, being able to understand um, this, this is a really beautiful story about a, a Japanese man who went back to his farm and actually cared for not just the animals on his farm, but many other abandoned um, animals after the Fukushima um, crisis and, um, and understanding how these kind of um, human induced crises also are having um, a huge effect on, on animals. So the way in which we respond to crises actually really matters. So all of you would have seen that when you have a large emergency, be that a conflict or a, a disaster situation, that a lot of communities would like to give uh, goods to that, um, to that particular crisis. Um, there's been a lot of advocacy now to try and 
uh, allow people to understand that often giving cash is best and then that cash can be used to support uh, both animals and humans uh, and, and you're not seeing a lot of this stuff that just goes to landfill. It ends up clogging up um, logistic hubs when it's coming into countries. It takes a lot of people hours to sort and then sometimes you can even cause community tensions in the way that it may be distributed because it's um, it's you know provided in an ad hoc way. So um, although people are very well-meaning, I think more advocacy needs to be done around this piece. Some of the research we've been doing has really been looking at some of the harm that humanitarian response can have on the environment and which has a knock-on effect obviously for both animals and for humans. So we're looking at um, a lot to do with the pollution of, of fresh water sources, um, a lot also to do with waste and, and plastic. And this, um, and of course, don't get me wrong, this is this is through a, 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 um, a situation where people's coping mechanisms and their access to other resources have been depleted because of a disaster or because of conflict. So we see people needing to access, um, you know, you know, in the clearing of land, for example, or the, the access of water, which is actually having a, a very, um, a really, um, an, an impact that's going to really impact on generations um, down the line and is, it's going to have some very, um, you know, impacts that are going to um, ensure that people who are, you know, moving are displaced. If people are going to be displaced, their coping mechanisms are undermined um, straight away, and those mechanisms are going to have uh, a knock-on effect for the environment. So, what should we do about that when we come to looking at? greening humanitarian action what do we actually what are we actually talking about there and it's something we need to be able to measure we need to be able to demonstrate that we're taking action to um to respond in ways in which as i mentioned are treading more gently on the earth so We've been doing some thinking about this and we're trying to actually come up with a framework that humanitarian agencies can use and really it's based around these kind of issues and these are these are things that you would all know it, it, it really builds on what Amanda was saying about how we're approaching and really addressing climate action. Um, but these are really practical ways in which we'd like to see humanitarian agencies really um, not see these just as a nice to have, but are actually critical to the way in which they operate. So it's really around um, so I'll give you the example of, of water, for example, and, and waste. Uh, in some of the um, responses to cyclones in the Pacific, we're seeing that the numbers of, uh, of bottles of water being sent to some of these countries, you know, in um, the, the recent response to the tsunami in Tonga, more than 84,000 bottles of water were sent in there. So trying to work out how can we use desalination or other kind of ways of providing water to crisis affected people and animals that are not going to be having this, um, this impact that's going to have a long-term uh, negative impact. So in terms of doing that, it all sounds like a great idea, doesn't it? But what are some of the barriers and enablers? So in terms of the barriers, Unfortunately, you may hear people who work for humanitarian agencies often say, I'm, I'm too busy saving lives to think about the environment. And this is something that we need to, to really overcome. And, and the fact that it's seen as a, um, an additional burden that, that organisations have to, to deal with, it's seen as very aspirational and not something that's seen as possible. So we need to change that. Also, there's very much a gap between uh, the policy and the practice. There is some great thinking out there, but it's not something that's built into every response. Um, also, power dynamics, and this links into what I was saying about First Nations people and really valuing um, the knowledge of local organisations. Often local organisations, um, they're not in the driver's seat and they're not involved in making decisions. And this is something that needs to change if we're going to um, see success yes. here. And when we're talking about the enablers though, and again, I wanna be positive about how things are shifting. I think actually the humanitarian sector is being able to see some positive examples, both from the public and the private sectors um, when it comes to environmental work. There's also some strong evidence now, which is hopefully moving the dial and changing behavior because the, um, you know, the evidence and the statistics is there about why we need to do this and why it actually provides a better response in the first place. Um, 
And also there's complementary agendas. I mean, I'm sure many of you who are involved in the space are also looking at how we can have an inclusive response. How can we ensure that we're, we're seeing localization, so locally led response, how are we seeing modalities like cash being used more, more often, and also accountability to those very communities that are impacted by these disasters. So that's a really important and key part there. So really our research is looking for a greener humanitarian system that saves lives today and tomorrow. It's not just about what's happening in the moment. We must look at how both animals and humans are impacted as we're responding to a crisis because we can exacerbate and make things worse. So there we're really wanting to take that principle to humanitarian action and ensure we're able to apply that in a broader sense. From a very operational sense, many of you will be aware of the, the cluster approach that is how the international humanitarian system works. And from there, we're really trying to look at what are the kind of environmental uh, impacts that those different clusters or those different sectors have. So it, it could be everything from how people are cooking in uh, refugee camps. It's looking at um, how, how you're going to be keeping people warm. How do you move people around? How do you um, keep people safe uh, in the various, um, dis you know, they may be displaced or the various communities that they're living in? So you can see it's quite a practical approach. And just a quick example from the recent um, uh, volcanic eruption and tsunami in Tonga, there were some really positive things that, that happened there. So we're also looking at um, really trying to understand what anticipatory action looks like there. And again, is that the evacuation of animals and people, but it's also pre-positioning stock. It's ensuring that there are, there are cash-based programming that can, then it can happen. It's leveraging and understanding and respecting traditional knowledge and wisdom. It's ensuring that communities are able to be in the driver's seat, that they were accountable to them and they are able to make decisions. There's a great example of how communities were able to um, go out and collect a huge amount of single use plastic and bring that in. This was all done by communities after the tsunami happened. It was brought in, it was compacted by support by the New Zealand and Australian governments, and it was actually put on some of the Australian Defence Force ships. And the thing I would say is on the adaptation piece, I think we talk a lot about different programs and how we can do climate change adaptation, but also adaptation to some of the actual physical um, impacts of disasters. So the, the picture on the left is in Tonga um, after that volcanic eruption and, and areas that have been impacted by ashfall where animals and humans are not able to, to, to live at the moment because of that. How do we adapt to that? How do we um, get and support communities to be able to support animal and wildlife populations and ecosystems. And the other picture here is also looking at coral reefs after earthquakes, where you're seeing incredible sort of tectonic shifts and uplift of reefs. What happens to some of these ecosystems um, when they've been exposed to these, um, you know, huge shifts? And how do we work differently, tread gently, and really try and ensure that we're custodians and stewardships of these really fragile environments? Thank you very much. I'll leave that there and we can get on to the next speaker. Uh, Beth, thank you so much for that. Uh, just to summarize, just, just want to say one line. Uh, our inability to value nature is the reason we have disasters. That was what Amanda said. Our inability to value nature in disasters, we actually are causing more disasters. And that's why I think we really need a green humanitarian response. So that was uh, a perfect rendition. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, I apologize, I didn't mean chronological order, I meant alphabetical order. So the next person is Kelly. Okay, I'm hoping you can all hear me okay. Um, it's been, it's such an honor to be here and thank you so much for having me as part of this panel. Um, Amanda and Beth, you have already set the bar with um, some really incredibly uh, inspiring and interesting things that we all need to be considering during this um, 
in this work in disaster management. And while my title is uh, refers to disaster response, I really want to talk about beyond the response and what we do before um, before something happens and long after, um, while response still remains a big part of our work. So why do we consider animals in disasters? And I think obviously we, most of us here already um, have a pretty good understanding of, of why these, uh, why animals, be it companion animals or livestock, um, wildlife are important um, when, dis when discussing disaster management. And for one thing, you know, we really feel um, at the Humane Society family of organizations is that when we know better, we do better. And that is they are, they are sentient beings. And these animals deserve protection in their own right. And I think to the point of, you know, when talking about what do we value and, and that being sort of a key part of evaluating risk is also just valuing animals as um, fellow sentient beings um, on this planet. And then we know from more of a, a strategic standpoint that not protecting animals in disasters often interferes with our human, human humanitarian response. Um, many times people go back or don't evacuate um, because they are not able to take their animals. We learned this um, really the hard way uh, in 2005 with Hurricane Katrina in Louisiana, where um, research afterwards showed that about 40% of people uh, did not evacuate when they could have because they weren't able to bring their animals with them. And as I'm so pleased that's been already very much um, talked about in the previous uh, discussions is that the human animal bond is so critical for um, resilience, both for the animals and humans. And I think this is becoming far more well known. And while it's it's a bit more intuitive with companion animals, we're seeing um, this in, in livestock as well. And while there might be an economic cost to losing livestock um, to a disaster, there's more than that. And we're actually starting some research, especially in India, to really show the psycho and social impacts of losing animals, even if the economic value is going to be um, uh, replaced. And just to kind of give an example, um, as we know, in, in February, there was a, a horrible earthquake um, in Turkey and in Syria. And we spent about three weeks there during search and rescue, which largely was um, trying to find people's lost pets um, when they were uh, tragically separated during, um, during this uh, disaster. And so one of the cases was Layla in Iskandran, um, which is just uh, about an hour away from Antakya, which was the core area where we were doing our work. Um, and we got we would get locations like this and we would be asked to please go and see if we can find their animals. Um, we drove the hour multiple times a day um, for many days trying to get um, to, you can see here on um, where uh, Layla's house was um, to see if we could find Layla. And it was very difficult. Um, at first we were not sure if she had even survived. Um, we were able to one night see that she was indeed still alive, but um, terrified and taking uh, refuge in her house. And her owner had been evacuated to uh, Istanbul because she had broken her leg jumping out of the building as it was collapsing, um, which she was told me later was she was only able to do because Layla had woken her up um, just minutes before the earthquake um, struck. And so one of the things we learned um, that was a really good tool was to ask Layla, Layla from the owner. Leila, al oh, kızım. Ah, Leila, yeah. Leila, Leila. And we. Oops, are you able to hear me? Okay, sorry, I got to notice that I was muted. Um, we were able to play those recordings as a way to um coax these animals out from where they were really terrified. And you might ask, why don't we just set traps? It was really difficult with a number of street animals to be able to um, set traps efficiently and, and catch the target animals. Um, so this became a really great way to uh, be able to capture and reunite um, pets with their owners. And I think not only was it just a great tool, but it actually just proved how strong that bond is um, for both people and the animals. And um, I recently saw Layla and Rumi, her owner here, who have both recovered and are back in Iskenderun, um just a few weeks ago and in Turkey. Eh?
So what is our role in disaster management? Um, obviously, we do quite a bit of response work, but we also are looking at how we can reduce risk, prevent suffering, and improve resiliency. We work with communities and stakeholders from governments to veterinarians um, to humanitarian groups to try to develop hello, hello, uh, sorry, um, uh, full plans that are able to serve anyone. We truly really care about all animals. And so we don't just focus on the companion animals, but also farm animals and of course, wildlife. And we truly believe in the power of partnerships. Um, we can't do this by ourselves. And there's, as you can see, so much work needed um, around the world that we really, everywhere we go, we try to seek out um, relationships with local groups and other INGOs or governments um, to amplify the work that we're all trying to achieve. So during responses, as I, as I mentioned, we do um, search and rescue. We also provide temporary sheltering, particularly in the US or in areas where this is um, an effective measure. We have found that in some places it's not the best um, way to, to do a response. So we try to be very conscious about what our impact um, and our activities um, and how they're going to play into the long-term recovery of a community. Especially in the US, we're finding far more um, needs in just providing community relief and local support to help people and organizations recover. Um, thankfully, there has been some changes since Hurricane Katrina and that many animals are evacuated with their people. And so there are fewer needs for some of that direct, direct rescue work. And so our role has shifted a bit into making sure that people are able to stay with their animals as they recover um, during that phase. Working with shelters in the US, we also do some pre-storm relocation. If there are shelters uh, in the path of storms um, that either may not have a facility that is able to withstand the potential damage or that is able, um, will play a key role in their community post, um, post the, the post storm, we wanna remove all the um, adoptable animals to um, areas that are not going to be impacted and hope that they can seek adoption um, with our shelter and rescue partners uh, in other parts of the US, allowing the shelter that will be impacted to focus solely on, on the needs and providing community um, support uh, after the storm passes. And of course, reunification is something that we um, truly believe it should always be a priority when dealing with um, any sort of owned animals. And we saw this quite a bit in, um, Hurricane Ian, which hit uh, last September in 2022. Um, and we ended up responding to one of the more underserved communities in Florida, um, which was Charlotte County. We set up a point of distribution center um, to provide pet food and other supplies as people lost pretty much everything. And then we also realized there was a significant need to provide um, Free, free veterinary care for people um, who may have never even had their animals see a vet prior to because of limited access to care. Um, so I'm gonna play a small video, um, just the way that my screen sharing showed up. Please just unmute yourself and let me know if this is not coming through properly. We've just been so grateful to be able to be here to help. It's like a, it's a struggle here, but we won't go anywhere without him. He's our family, so we're really grateful that you guys are here. You're gonna make me tear. It's a true story. <laughs> The hurricane was one of the worst that's come to the state in decades. Charlotte County was one of the most affected areas. We've sort of called it the Forgotten County. It's an area where there's communities that are, are already underserved. We decided to put up a point of distribution, pet food, supplies, and anything else that people needed. More than 600 cars a day were coming through. Our so many people lost their homes and so we are just providing this free service and we just want to do our best to make sure that people can um, stay with their animals that they don't have to give them up just because they can't afford to feed them right now we're 
so grateful to the Charlotte County Department of Animal Services and the Animal Control Unit that asked us to come out and have been working side by side with us since the beginning. And we are committed to this county, to this area, to keep working on the recovery process and for future storms. Okay, so we know that obviously response is going to be always part of our work, but we're trying really hard to work with organizations and communities to better prepare and plan for um, potential disasters. And so we definitely strive to have, work with um, uh, especially animal shelters or other community groups um, to consider what their likely hazards are, what those impacts might look like, and to develop plans. Um, what were their role will be in, uh, in a disaster response and what actions can they take now to try to reduce um, any significant impacts um, that can be creating SOPs or other trainings that are need to be taken and how will their team coordinate not only externally but internally as well. What are the other key stakeholders that they should be coordinating with? Uh, we, we find that there's lots of um, local, state, and national uh, stakeholders that are really important to engage, especially prior to a, a disaster. Um, and I think, especially to Beth's point about um, donations, we are still continuing to find this to be not always um, a challenging thing to, to deal with and, and significant uh, donations coming in that may not always be particularly useful and often go to waste. And so we're really trying to look ahead and, and um, focus on what are the donation needs and how to best manage them. Um, so I'm, I'm looking forward to hopefully, hopefully speaking with Beth about that more at some point. Uh, again, making sure that when an organization considers their own response, they're thinking about how is that going to fit in with the local animal control, police department, fire, and other emergency management agencies, and that that is all, um, it's complementary and works well together. And then, of course, training and practicing. Um, you have to practice these things and we, we really push on trying to do drills at least tabletops um, to really look through play it out um, and see how well this is going to work when a disaster strikes because nothing is going to be perfect and knowing how to be flexible and adaptive to whatever is um, in front of you is, is really critically important. Um, and to that point, we're we're doing a lot more work in disaster risk reduction and looking at um, what we could have what we could have done if we had foreseen a particular disaster and what um, we could do to help communities plan ahead. So in Guatemala, we've been um, actively working to create um, an animal protocol for disaster uh, animals and disasters that is done through the um, the national government. Um, and this protocol was the first step in really getting animals on um, the radar for when disasters did strike. And um, when uh, Volcano Pacaya erupted in 2001, um, we were able to provide some uh, support to the community that was closest uh, to the uh, lava flows, which you can see here um, on the left hand, came about 200 meters from the closest house at that community, um, but it still devastated grazing lands and farming land um, and nearly risked the lives of many um, people and animals. And so we worked together with them to uh, in, in uh, 2022 to develop early warning systems and, um, act and then actually conducted a drill with the whole community and the different stakeholders from both the national uh, local and provincial um, governments and the Veterinary Association uh, to be able to coordinate um, what it would look like in the event that that early warning system goes off in the future and that everyone knew their role and we practiced it out, um, including with the animals. Guatemala is considered a highly vulnerable country to natural disasters. Every year, 
This region faces several events such as hurricanes, volcanic eruptions, earthquakes and floods. During 2021, the geothermal activity at the Pacaya volcano threatened its surroundings, exposing the high risk in which the neighboring communities find themselves. In 2019, the Guatemala authorities approved a response protocol for the care of animals in disasters, which contemplates a preparation phase for communities with potential risk. Among these communities is the village of San Jose El Rodeo in San Vicente Pacaya, Escuintla. In May 2022, Humane Society International Latin America and Equino Sanos para el Pueblo Foundation, in coordination with local authorities, carried out a drill exercise in order to prepare the San Jose El Rodeo community for a potential volcanic eruption. Experts from the HSI disaster team observed the activity and proposed recommendations. For the first time in Guatemala, companion and farm animals were contemplated in this process. They will directly benefit the animal and will allow the inhabitants to recover faster from the effects of the disaster, thus understanding that human and animal health are closely related. Fue una actividad de mucho beneficio y mucha experiencia para todos como comunidad, porque esto pues puede ser útil en un momento preciso, que estamos en un área de desastre, que en cualquier momento se nos pueda presentar la ocasión. Y ya con esto que aprendimos, pues es un gran paso para cuando sea necesario que no tengamos que usar esta experiencia. Hi, I am Kelly Donathan. I'm the director of Animal Disaster Response for Humane Society International. And we're here right now at the foothills of Volcano Placayo, which is here in Guatemala. And we just finished uh, a disaster drill um, for the potential explosion or eruption of this volcano, which remains to be quite active and actually erupted even just last year. And this type of work, doing preparedness and mitigation with communities, is so incredibly important to what we do all over the world. Mi nombre es Mauricio Mota, soy director de país para Humane Society International en Guatemala. El día de hoy estamos en la comunidad de San José del Rodeo, en San Vicente Pacaya, Escuintla, eh, finalizando eh, la actividad de un simulacro para el rescate de animales en caso de una erupción volcánica. Este proyecto eh, pues, es eh, realizado por la Fundación Equinos Sanos para el Pueblo, eh, con el apoyo de Humane Society International y tiene como fin hacer una preparación a la comunidad en caso de algún desastre, ¿verdad? Que no solo eh, pues salven a los, a, los, a los seres humanos, sino también a los animales. At HSI, we support the care of animals in disasters as we consider them important members of affected communities. The inner relation between humans and animals is a fundamental part of this community's resilience. This is why we support those most vulnerable to disasters, such as the case of the San Jose El Rodeo village. By caring for farm and companion animals in events like volcanic eruptions, we are helping communities recover faster from the impact of disasters. I apologize that all the subtitles came through on that. And I also apologize you've had to hear me twice in the videos. Thankfully, we are ex quickly expanding our capacity and have um, a uh, increasing teams throughout the world that, um, that are doing incredible work, like in India, where a lot of our community-based preparedness um, work is, is happening, and especially in the south uh, western state of Kerala, which uh, regularly um, is impacted by significant floods. And so by working both with the local government, um, the schools and different um, uh, other agencies, they've been doing a lot of work to prepare not only the communities themselves, but also discuss with other um, disaster management authorities there of how they can, can include um, animals, not only for the animal's sake, but for people. Um, we constantly have come across uh, uh, communities where the whole families have been lost because they would not leave without their livestock. And right now there has not been any way, um, any place to, to shelter those livestock um, when a uh, potential disaster is coming. And so we have been working with them to um, look at the different human uh, shelter sites that are already identified and operated um, during disasters in Kerala. And then also looking at the animal, both livestock and companion animal um, populations, as well as other risk factors such as 
in, um, evacuation routes and um, capacity uh, to see where we can identify where these animal shelters can be co-located um, along with the human shelters so that people have a plan and a place um, to be able to bring their animals to, as well as support from the uh, from our, our HSI team in India, as well as um, the local authorities to help people get their animals to a safe place and allow them to also seek shelter themselves and get them out of the path of, um, of these hazards. And lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about, um, it, it's already again been mentioned a bit about multi-hazards. Nowadays, things are not happening in isolation. Um, we have lots of things that, lots of hazards that are ongoing long-term like perpetual drought in, um, in Eastern uh, Africa. And, um, and how it's not, it's not something that we can easily respond to. Um, we are providing some supplementary food and water for uh, for certain wildlife and livestock, um, but that's not truly the most um, sustainable operation. And so we're trying to think about um, both what other hazards can be coming along and what kind of anticipatory action can we do um, to help mitigate some of this uh, risk and impact. Um, the drought is not surprisingly causing an increase in human wildlife conflict, um, especially along uh, the Tana River, which is really the only main, uh, real source of water for the wildlife. And of course, where um, farmers prefer to um, farm their crops so that they can bring that water in from the river. Um, and so especially mango trees, um, the flowers are a delicacy for the giraffe, um, which are a endangered species um, in that area. And they will start to implement um, as soon as necessary. So I hope I didn't go too long. Um, we absolutely love partnerships. I, um, again, thank, thank you so much in the other panels, um, speakers today, and uh, I hope we'll hear from many of you and what you're doing and how maybe we can work together. Perfect. Thank you so much for that, Kelly. And thank you for sharing those videos and especially sharing all those stories with us. Um, they are the reasons why we do these things and why this is so important. And yes, when we want to know better, I think that's when we do better. <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. Uh, I will now hand over to Dr. Steve Blassie. Excellent. That's my time to get the technology working. So please hold. Your call is important to us. Right. Share my <laughs> screen. Let's see what we can do here. It's all good. Tech, tech problems happen all the time. We just have to be yeah. flexible. Now, is that coming up or looking all good if I go to that view? Can you see the main screen? Is that working? Uh, I don't see it yet. No, that's not a good sign. No, we're not seeing no. anything, Steve. Keep trying oh. another button. Stand by. It's all good. This is normally how it happens in disasters as well. Be ready for everything. <laughs> Always a crisis. All right, let's see what we can do. He's screen two. Oh, here we go. This is another button I'll try. Let's see if this one works. Does that work? It, it works. All right, okay. Okay, so look, thanks everyone. And it's been great hearing from Amanda, uh, Beth and Kelly who are just you know fantastic experts to um, share this panel with um, and also our other speakers as well. Um, so um, Ultimush was um, kind enough to invite me to have a quick talk about animal disaster management law. Um, I'll do that with a New Zealand perspective, but also referencing uh, you know, some international examples um, is, as well. So for those that don't know it, um, New Zealand's at the top of the world um, or down under is in some people's orientation of the World Atlas. And um, we're not part of Australia, even though um, Beth and Amanda Bay claim credit to New Zealand maybe occasionally, or at least our Pavlova or our racehorses. Um, but nevertheless, we are our own, own country, although at one stage we were part of New South Wales for a few months, which we generally deny. Anyhow, you may remember New Zealand or know New Zealand uh, from uh, uh, the Hobbits. Um, we're generally more famous now about 
hobbits than what we are from sheep. Um, but a few years ago, during the Kaikoura earth, earthquake, um, the world held its breath, wondering about the fate of the three cows that were stuck on this landslide created island. Um, and yes, they were all safely saved, but um, that was I think, one of the key BBC stories. Um, people were more worried about the animals than what they were of people. So this is why animals can be important. Um, there's um, geopolitical considerations or, or perceptions people can have of uh, one's country uh, based on how they manage and treat animals uh, in disasters. So if we look at the New Zealand uh, Animal Disaster Management Framework, um, it's really across two key pieces of legislation. There's a disaster management uh, legislation, the Civil Defence Emergency Management Act, and also the Animal Welfare Act. So for those in the US, um, the Robert T. Stafford um, Act is like our Emergency Management Act. And under that act creates um, subordinate legislation such as the National Civil Defence Plan Order. Um, so New Zealand has a bit of a fragmented um, and it doesn't have an animal inclusive animal disaster legislation or animal disaster management framework. Um, and that's one thing that I and others have been trying to advocate for. Um, you would think that um, learning the lessons of uh, the US, as, as Kelly mentioned, the Hurricane Katrina in 2005 uh, and the impacts that had on uh, not just uh, animal safety, but also human safety, um, the need for specific legislation was passed. And that was passed uh, you know, in the following year. Um, so many years on, New Zealand still hasn't created any such similar uh, laws. Um, the, the, the current legislation in New Zealand is actually under review, and there's actually an opportunity for New Zealand to do some bold leadership and actually pull together all the bits of what a good disaster management framework that's inclusive of animals should look like. And hopefully that could be something that we could hold up to the rest of the world uh, as a model um, model act. Um, but it has all these vagaries of principles uh, which are not enforceable. <laughs> um, so unlike the Pets Act in the US, um, there's nothing really that's uh, really solid. It has these unenforceable principles. The funding's not tied to it. Um, it's got quite inconsistent powers, emergency powers, some powers you can do for the protection of human life, some are just for life. What does life mean? If, if in other sections we're saying human life, does that mean there's actually two types of life? Um, is sentient life? Uh, it raises a whole range of issues. Um, probably sort of of note, the most highly vulnerable animals are the most exposed. So even if we look at the Pets Act, the Pets Act was principally there for the protection of humans because of the human-animal bond. But it's the animals that don't have that bond that are usually most vulnerable. Um, so if we look at Amanda's ecosystem of animals being, or well, humans being part of the ecosystem, not the, the top of the ecosystem, uh, we've got a lot of work to do. So recently in the US, there's obviously been a new rule that's come out um, that basically makes uh, animals in um, facilities uh, that they have to have contingency plans and training for. No one's responsible for actually carrying out animal rescues and disasters in New Zealand. Uh, so there's a coordination function, but the coordination function doesn't actually have fire and emergency at the table, which was going back to what Kelly was saying, was saying, are your plans, uh, are your plans on board with you know, the fire agencies, the police agencies, et cetera? So we have a very animal agricultural focus to animal disaster management. Um, we don't even have the Department of Conservation, which is essentially parks and wildlife at the table either. So when you look at Australia, they lost 3 billion um, animals, in particular wildlife. Um, New Zealand, we don't even have those government agencies at or mandated in any of our plans, um, which you know, with climate change has kind of become a real issue. Um, there's areas of law. Um, and we've got this unbridled power um, that uh, officials can just destroy animals as they as they deem fit, 
um, with um, legal uh, protections. Um, it was in 1994, I think it was, I reviewed a health emergency management plan for, for civil defence, um, and it spoke about animals, and it said that in a big disaster, um, we may be competing, uh, humans may compete for food with with companion animals. So one of the treatment strategies was to destroy all all companion animals. Now, I don't know about you, but um, uh, it was probably about 15 or even 20 years ago that I tried um, a can of Pell Meaty Bites. And I can assure you, I'm pretty happy to leave that uh, for my dog to have. Uh, rather salty and quite displeasant, really. Anyway, plans are... Uh, have been developed, but they've got no legal status. So they've got the same legal status as a post-it note. Um, there are instruments in New Zealand law and the emergency management law that if you create plans, you can have them incorporated by reference, which means they become legally binding, they become enforceable. In fact, it's an offence to not comply with a civil defence plan. So we had these plans that were written, but because they were animals, uh, they weren't afforded the same protections or status. So we have all these nice-to-haves with no real guts behind it. So um, myself and others have been sort of quite concerned, uh, you know, in terms of you know, New Zealand's um, uh, opportunity not really taken up to create world-leading legislation. Now, it's interesting because for some time, New Zealand's quite keen to go and tell the world we're world leading in animal welfare. Um, that may have been the case 20 years ago, but the World Animal Protection Index, we rate, we rank as a C. We're on, we're on par with, um, uh, with Mexico, India. So we're not actually world leaders in animal welfare at all. Um, so but we can be, and that's where we can take the sort of positive direction. So originally 2010 is when um, a report uh, was some of the first research that I did um, provided a report to government. It was like, yes, thanks for your feedback. <laughs> Nothing happened. Uh, we had uh, Hurricane Katrina um, that, that fed into that report. We had a number of disasters in New Zealand. There was a ministerial review on emergency management. So it's basically like, FEMA doing a review of FEMA and their arrangements. 10% of submissions raise concerns about animals. But the reviewer who I met as the CEO of one of the SPCA, first of all, said he didn't like animals. So um, they were relegated to as a annex um, that could be worth consideration at a later point. Um, so we pulled in, pulled in the big guns and we pulled in Craig Fugate. And I'm sure Kelly and others will know Craig Fugate, uh, but he was the former administrator from, with um, FEMA um, post, uh, and, and responsible for a lot of the reforms post Katrina. So he came in to actually help um, support a significant report around legal reform. Um, and we thought, well, if, you, if you've got to be pretty impressive to say that you know more about emergency management than Craig Fugate, but apparently some people did. Um, so nothing happened really there. We had a national disaster resilience strategy. Um, I used to work for the government agency responsible for these strategies, and I know how many people don't make a submission on the national disaster resilience strategy. I think there's like 40 when I was there at the ministry. We managed to gain, gain over 100 submissions it was the largest amount of public submissions ever for a disaster resilience strategy in New Zealand history. There was no change. So here we are in 2023. Uh, there's a trifecta project which brings together the emergency management legislation, the strategy and the plan, and submissions close on the third. So um, a, a charity that I'm, I'm patron of um, has been uh, undertaking a campaign to get no animal left behind. And you can sort of see there's a whole bunch of sort of podcasts and media interviews, et cetera. Um, essentially, we've become so, so um, uh, passionate slash frustrated about the lack of animal inclusive legislation that as a charity, we've actually stopped doing response. We said it's unsustainable, it's not scalable, and animals are gonna suffer in their tens of thousands 
our responses, we may save hundreds maybe or dozens of animals. So we're actually best to put our focus into the, the more comprehensive approach that Kelly was talking about. It's got to be more than just response. It's got to be about the disaster risk reduction. Um, so in effect, we have basically emptied our charity's bank accounts into a national media campaign um, to get change. So when we look at um, law, because in all reality, Governments only really do things if they're required to do it, because if it's not, they're not required to do it, then it's not really appropriate then to use um, taxpayers or public funds on something that they actually aren't obligated to do. So it's critical that we work in, um, that everyone sees the value in championing change at a legislative level, because we can actually save more animals through prevention. So to give you an idea, um, the, the report that I wrote in 2010, there was 34 pages. The report from one from SPCA was their CEO on the National Civil Defence um, Review, 14 pages. The report that went to par Parliament, 45 pages. Heck, I even did a PhD thesis, 280 pages. And so we have a government department, the Minister of Primary Industries, because it's not seen as a cross-cutting issue. It's seen as that this is an agricultural problem, it's an agricultural thing, but animals aren't. They're across all aspects of society. However, the Ministry for Primary Industries in New Zealand is responsible for providing government ad advice to the government on animal welfare and emergency. And in their submission to the trifecta or the emergency management bill, 1.3 pages. That was what our government agency with 3,600 people put forward for how we could improve animal disaster management law in New Zealand. It's pretty underwhelming. It's one of the reasons why uh, ours, ourselves and other charities in New Zealand have been calling for a commissioner for animals because it's obvious that we've got a system that's, that's not working in the best interests of animals. So what do we need? Well, we need to have greater accountability and transparency. Um, uh, there is a international panel of, panel of animal disaster management, uh, international pan panel for animal disaster management law that's being that's being formed, and there's a QR code down there which I'd encourage encourage everyone and um, any listeners viewers to to participate in as well. Um, there is a model act for animal welfare um, that was developed in 2016. Uh, but the idea is that, and I've been speaking to Ultimash about this, is um, yes, we can keep going out there and responding and, and um, doing our sort of thing, but it's actually not, it's not sustainable, especially with the amount of disasters on the increase. We've got to get way before anything's happening. We, we've got to make uh, animals a, a greater focus in DRR. Um, so if we have a model act, that means we can actually finally measure governments and states against one another in terms of their progress, and we can track progress. But unless we have like an animal protection index, now there's an animal protection index uh, developed by World Animal Protection. Um, again, it makes sort of sense to use that as the baseline and then have some supplementary uh, metrics for animal disaster management, just like having a specific model act for animal disaster management that builds on the existing model animal welfare act. Um, but it's really important that we start to see the mainstream of animals and disaster management. This is not an ag issue. This is not a, um, a, a save the fluffy bunny rabbit kind of um, campaign. Animals are intrinsically linked into people's psychosocial uh, well-being, their livelihoods, their, their economic sort of interests, um, their psychosocial well-being. There's so many aspects why it's really important. Um, so if we have um, some tools where we can actually start to say, well, where does New Zealand sit? Are we world leading? A difference. So, I would say there is no evidence to support the notion that New Zealand has world-leading animal disaster management legislation. But 
it does have the opportunity in the coming months to create world-leading animal inclusive animal disaster management laws as part of wider emergency management reform. And just in the last few days, New Zealand has voted for change and we have a new elected government. Uh, and we have uh, MPs like Chris Bishop here, who's um, a local MP here in Wellington, who is absolutely nuts about his, his dog as well. So we're hoping that we'll be able to find that um, now that we've got a change in government, will we get uh, some members of parliament that are more open to doing the right thing and uh, putting forward a better framework to protect both humans and animals? So hopefully we can develop something that the rest of the world can, can lever off. And there we have it. I am done. Over to you. Next caller. Uh, Dr. Steve, thank you so much for that. Uh, that was very insightful. And actually, my presentation is going to answer a few of the questions that you raised. So uh, just 30 minutes. Uh, but thank you so much for your presentation. And now I'll hand over to our last speaker before me, uh, Varnika from India. Thank you, Altamash. So can I share my... Is it visible? Uh, I can see a part of it. Now it's good. Yeah. So hello, everyone, distinguished kids and fellow participants. As the final speaker in today's discussion on the impact of natural disasters, I will turn the attention to a facet of these catastrophic events that often remains overshadowed within the construct of India. While natural disasters inflict widespread devastation on human lives and infrastructure, the repercussions are equally severe for the animal kingdom. Like for instance, if I have to give the example, in northeastern state of India called Assam lies a Kaziranga National Park, which is home to a significant population of the one-horned rhinosaurus. And each year, there is a river in Assam called Brahmaputra. Each, each year in that river, uh, floods come that result in displacement of and loss of life of both humans and animals. The, this national park is known for its rich biodiversity and it faces a daunting task in protecting its inhabitants, including the one on rhinosaurus. So in this discussion, I will explore the existing laws and policies that put forth to address these challenges and ensure the welfare of our animal counterparts in times of these crises. So India in the past has witnessed many natural disasters like Odisha super cyclone in 1999, Gujarat earthquake in 2001, Indian Ocean tsunami in 2004. There were drought in 10 states in 2015 and 2016, which estimated 330 million people were affected and uh, recently uh, this year there were floods in the northern part of India uh, the mountain area or uh, states of Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh and in August 2018 in the state of Kerala which is the southernmost state of India there was excessive rainfall due to which uh, it, it led to floods and landslides and as per the data of the Disaster Management Authority of the state government, this resulted in the death of large number of cattle, goats, and poultry. There was destruction of cattle shed, shortage of fodder, wet services, and vaccines. The flood resulted in death of 40,188 large animals, 7765 small animals. Also, uh, every year, number of humans and animals dies or displaced in river Bar Brahmaputra, as I said earlier in the Assam. So I have some data in that context. In the year 2020, more than 100 wild animals died in Kaziranga National Park. And in the year two, 2022, 48 lakh people and 33 lakh animals got affected. This year in 2023, 1.20 lakh people in 20 districts of the state have been affected and over 1 lakh domestic animals and poultry have also been affected in the first spell of the floods. 
further uh, if we if i talk about for this year for kaziranga national park uh, nine animals died there and other than these big disasters which comes in international news there there all there are also small uh, small disasters which are uh, which goes unnoticed so these incidents while not as widespread are also devastating and they have uh, effect on the communities involved so recently such uh, small level disaster happened in july 2023 in the national capital region of india uh, the new delhi area it, it is called and there is a river yamuna so it was uh, it was a, not a natural disaster at all it was a man made disaster because there was so much rain this year so the doors of the dams were opened without giving any warning to the local people who were living at the nearby area and because of that there was extra flooding so uh in this this is these are some of the pictures of saving the animals by of uh, fiapo the federation of indian animal protection organization and so i think it is important to recognize all kind of disasters that are taking place whether they are small scale or the whether they are large scale um if i give a bit of statistics on the frequency of disasters has increased tremendously over the last decade according to the center for research on the epidemiology of disasters 432 disasters occurred in 2021 whereas in comparison the average number of disasters for the 20 year period from 20 2001 to 2022 was 347 among all continents asia was the worst hit with 40% of the disaster share and india has witnessed 191 disasters in the past 11 years so what is the geoclimatic condition of india i would like to put light on that it has um, india is vulnerable to disasters and it is in varying degrees to floods droughts cyclones tsunamis earthquake urban flooding landslides avalanches and forest fire so there are 28 states and eight union territories in the country out of which 27 are disaster prone 58.6% landmark is prone to earthquakes of moderate to very high density 12% land is prone to flood and river erosion um and 68% of the cultivable land is vulnerable to drought hilly areas are at risk from landslides and avalanches and 15% of the land mass is prone to landslides so having said that um there is an act if i come to policy and legislation there is an act for disaster management which is called the disaster management act of 2005 it was enforced after the uh, tsunami indian ocean tsunami which came in 2004 and the objective of the act is to provide for the effective management of disasters and for matters connected therewith so but the important point, point to note is that this act do not cover animals uh in the scenario but uh, but it has included some uh, like important definitions of capacity building it defines disaster management it also include for a national level plan on disaster management it includes to make um authorities within the states because india is a quasi federal country so states also have their role and at at the national level uh, like this act is on the national level but the states can adopt this act so if there will be a national plan under this act either that can be adopted at the state level or a state can also come up with their different different uh, disaster plan so this national plan includes key aspects like it uh, there it emphasizes it emphasizes for disaster prevention mitigation integration into development plans it uh, highlights preparedness capacity building and the roles of various government ministries then there is also national disaster management policy so 
uh, in this policy uh, under the chapter 7 the animals have been covered what it says that is it is necessary to devise appropriate measures to protect animals and find means to shelter and feed them during disasters and their aftermath through a community effort to the extent possible so and also under its chapter 5 which refers to climate change um it has recognized animal health. It states that climate change is impacting our glacial reserves, water balance, agriculture, forestry, coastal ecology, biodiversity, and human and animal health. So though animals have been slowly being recognized, but the problem is again the enforcement because when we see the disasters that are occurring, there is no planning and the situation is really bad for both humans and animals for rescue. And if I talk about National Disaster Management Plan, so National Disaster Management Plan covers, it is in consonance with the Sandy Framework for Disaster Management. It includes uh, several um, hazard disasters like thunderstorm, lightning, squall, dust, strong wind, cloud burst, hailstorms, glacial lake outburst, flood, heat wave, biological and public health emergencies. And it also is, uh, includes climate change risk man management as new thematic area for the climate risk. The, this plan also includes recognized animals. Um, this plan has included search and rescue of animals in preparedness and response during disaster. It guides on different aspects on disposal of animal carcasses, evacuation of people and animals, fodder for livestock in scarcity hit areas, rescue of animals in four and emergency services. And then there is a do's and don'ts by the national disaster management authority so it is a document where few of the disasters have been mentioned and it is it is told that how humans shall behave and how they should be prepared for these disasters so under one of the disaster during thunderstorm dust storm and squall do's and don'ts for animals have been recognized and it states that during thunderstorm, dust storm, and squall, the animals shall be designated a safe area in or near the house to shelter your animals in a severe thunderstorm. The animals um, shall be kept away from open water, pond, or river. They should be away from tractors and other metal farm equipment. They should, shouldn't be allowed under the trees and they should be uh, closely uh, like they should be under under direct control so this is the structure of policy and legislation but however this is majorly on papers and during the recent 2023 the noida floods which i talked about the yamna floods the because I also helped on the ground during this disaster and the situation was really bad. We were not prepared for this because no warning was given by the government and a whole of a residential area, a farmhouse's area was under the water. There were pets in those area and then the people had just ran away. So we were rescuing those pets as much as we can because there was no space to go inside much and uh, after that not only in that area the other localities the street dogs were rescued they were uh, filled up in the truck and then they were sent to some shelters and most of the nearby sh uh, shelters were already filled so they were sent to another city however there was and, you know, no, uh, no help regarding the handling of these street dogs. The way they were filled under the truck was not right. But still, this work was not done by any government agency. But the, the, this work, as much as the NGOs could, 
they try to help. So even though animals are being recognized, there is Disaster Management Act. The problem which lies is the enforcement. So therefore, uh, what is the way forward and what are the challenges? Why, uh, why even after few of the policies in place, still there is no readiness during these disasters? So few challenges are limited resources, limited awareness, lack of training, lack of coordination. There are and really limited resources. There is really scarce funds. There's manpower, equipment, hinders swift responses. The, even for both human and animals, the main thing is there's no adequate funding. And also uh, there is not much of uh, awareness within the community about the importance of animal welfare uh, during such disasters. Even it is seen that uh, sometimes the owner of the animal leave the animal there. And if somebody is not coming, there are chances that the, the that dog or cat won't survive. So for this, training programs and workshops are really required and and people are required to educate and there is also in such disasters what happens is there is a lot of lack of coordination among the stakeholders the, between the animal NGOs the rehabilitation centers so if it would be better if you know there is effective communication and collaboration between organizations government volunteers so that a prompt action can be taken and what and to do this what can be done done as per my limited knowledge what i can think of is that tools and guidelines are required for risk assessment um uh, proper evaluation methods help identifying vulnerable animal population, enabling targeted rescue and aid efforts. So these resources like aid emergency responders, uh, veterinarians and policy makers in understanding the scale of impact, guiding efficient allocation of resources is what is required. So like we can learn from one of the disaster and can be ready now for another disaster if something like that happens again because um there are uh, there are a lot of rains every year now and uh, the frequency of rains and the flood is increasing so there are always chances that there could be flood so now as now we have seen this year we can be you know we can take the data and we can be more prepared for it proactive approach is what is required and there should be a uh, standard operating guidelines for animal evaluation, evacuation, um, for rescue. There should be clear protocols to, uh, to ensure systematic planning, efficient rescue operations and safe shelter for animals. And there should be research and exploration more. So there is, um, there is almost no research on, you know, how, to rescue animals during these explorations. So the, the plans with which the government has come, like the national plan or the national policy, more discussion is needed with the government so that the experts in this field can tell the government what kind of plan should they come up, both for humans and animals, because it is only not... Uh, animals but the situation is not good that good for humans also though yes they are the first priority they are saved but still a uh, better response can be made if we do it with much more preparedness so this is my presentation regarding this thank you uh, thank you so much Varnika uh, and for the work that you are doing uh i'll just take over from here uh speak about just 15 minutes just bringing all these thoughts together because 
I had predicted this and I think all of you also predicted it as well, but I think it will make sense now. Uh, can everybody see this? Perfect. So, uh, I mean, in, in the presentations that we heard today, uh, some something is always missing, you know. Uh, we say that response is important, but then we say that it's not enough unless we have legislative change. Then we have legislative change in some countries, but that still is not enough because we're missing something else. Like, for example, uh, as Beth mentioned, we do not have the screen humanitarian kind of response, and we basically don't look for climate risks either before disasters or within disasters. So it, it feels like... Uh, what what's really missing or what's what's uh, what we really need to see is actually how the whole framework like like what is a disaster prevention framework and what kind of things actually come into in, inside it uh, are some things that we really need to see so my attempt uh, is actually to bring forth or create some kind of a roadmap or or a map actually to see what actually is a part of disaster prevention framework even though we might not uh, consider it as a as a de facto part, but uh, as as a de jure part, it's actually it's it's actually really relevant. So, uh, one of the major reasons actually why we are not able to advance animal welfare, particularly in the disaster framework, is most of the language, like the words that we use, you know, uh, resilience or vulnerability or hazards. Uh, we use them in a sense that's very pro animal welfare and pro climate change. But the thing is, the way it's, these words are actually defined in, for example, the Sendai framework, which is the non binding uh, international legal resolution on disaster framework, does not include animals at all. It basically defines disasters or hazards uh, in which animal loss is actually considered as property damage. Uh, that's not, and, and that basically has a huge impact on, even if we make domestic changes, there's something missing. There's there's something that we need to see. And same as the case with vulnerability or even resilience. It's just that the, the terms that are used, for example, vulnerability is defined as a community. And if you actually go to Google or just look up in your simple definitions, the term community is mostly uh, restricted to human beings and animals are actually kept out of it. And that is the same way we, we define resilience as well. And this, this actually has a huge impact and it becomes kind of a driver for anthropocentrism and leaving animals out, even though uh, we are like, you know, with our fullest intentions trying to bring things together. Uh, so I believe that's, that's one really important factor that we need to acknowledge and understand. And the Sendai frameworks particularly uh, their goal actually is substantial reduction of disaster risk and in uh, and and losses in lives livelihoods and health the term animal is again not used the term livelihood is used basic, basically implying that the association or animals uh, inherent you know intrinsic value what do we value exactly comes from the the human side of things and and that basically aggravates more anthropocentrism and and but but the, even though the goal is good, which is something that I find is something that's not aligning with, with the current structure that we have in the Sendai framework. For example, the goal says that we have to prevent new and reduce existing disaster risk. We have to increase preparedness for response and recovery, and we have to prevent and reduce hazard exposures. But the thing is, uh, if we fail to include animals, we are basically not considering them uh, as a kind of a factor when we evaluate our other activities that can be uh, linked to increasing disaster risk. For example, uh, factory farming, uh, placing animals in, in a layered system, basically a very disastrous infrastructure, like for example, an earthquake happens and there's, if you can imagine, uh, a layered system where there's chicken over chicken in, in cages. When a disaster will happen, the impact on those animals will be much more severe. Uh, rather than having a free cage system. But the thing is, when uh, when we basically exclude animals from these kind of situations, the pre-disaster, in, in some words, environmental impact assessment or some kind of an idea where we're trying to acknowledge or understand what kind of risk or, you know, uh, can this kind of a project create. But we would not include those animal factors there as well. 
and and those would eventually flow and make it in, actually harder and in in other words impossible to achieve the goal of the Sendai frameworks and a really good example of this is is the actually the aquatic system and this is just common sense but the fact that humans cannot live underwater leads to like a complete ignorance of aquatic disasters and its impact on animals and humans uh, i would categorize this uh as as this you know this this lack of human animal bond and and that actually flows and and a good example of this actually positive example of this uh, aquatic system welfare reform some kind of is is what happened in new zealand a couple of years ago when there was this uh, gulf livestock one cruise that basically drowned and that led to a death of 6000 cattle uh, that caused massive effects on the aquatic system but as a result new zealand basically started this new policy of banning live animal export in a way i believe that this banning of live animal export and the linkage that it has to decrease risks and basically help us achieve the goals makes all of these policies these welfare policies this nature policies the climate policies a part of the disaster prevention framework and we have to basically see the full map if we want to basically envision an animal protection matrix and and for this i believe we need to look at five things number one is the why behind animal protection measures number two is pro animal protection measures which is basically stronger reforms and then there's the risks that are increasing these measures and and lastly the most important part which we in some ways ignore is the status of animals in legal systems in domestic countries and lastly the fifth one which is i would say pretty much absent everywhere is stakeholder accountability. Like if you violate this act, who's responsible? Um, so if we go through these things, uh, the why mostly behind animal protection measures is the human animal bond. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is uh, companion animals benefit from it is, is from the side of the human side of the animal, human animal bond. And, and that is the reason why, even though farmers develop this kind of a human animal bond with farm farm animals as well, but the thing is, uh, that does not lead to protection for farm animals because the farm animals in those cases are actually more confined to the animal end of that bond and, and the human value is actually missing. And, and that's one of the main reasons why we only have protection for companion animals and, and that's very restricted. In a way, we only have a disaster prevention framework for companion animals and, and the failure to include other animals specifically uh, creates further risk and basically causes more disasters and more animal deaths and even more human deaths. In examples for pro-animal protection measures in the, I mean, uh, I know mostly about these from the US, so I mentioned these, uh, which was the Pets Act. The main reason behind it was protecting the human animal bond. Then there was the new act that was passed two years ago, uh, actually one year ago, the Planning for Animal Wellness Act, which basically created these experts groups uh, to basically review how these uh, the funding has to be given or like how these disaster protection matrix has to be created. The third one that I really like uh, and, and that really encapsulates uh, the essence of disaster framework is the Industrial Agriculture Accountability Act. It's not passed yet. It's very rare that it will actually pass, but it the aim of this act is to basically uh, shut down factory farming. And uh, even though the reason is animal cruelty, but factory farming and meat production per se is responsible for 47% of the global carbon dioxide emissions and alone responsible for 7% of global warming. The failure to include these things in, in our framework is actually causing more disasters and leading to more human deaths, making it even more important. Uh, a few things that are really additionally important are the risks that are increasing these measures. Uh, which is basically applying these anthropocentric standards and uh, relegating animals to the periphery. Like, for example, if a disaster happens or 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 actually coming back to my previous example, like food systems, uh, evaluation or reforms are kept outside of the disaster prevention framework, even though they should be a major chunk of it, because food systems are directly responsible for many of these disasters, climate change and uh, coral reefs death like that happen underwater, and the impact that it has on biodiversity loss is massive, but it's unrecorded because uh, humans sadly don't live underwater, and and that's a debate that we need to you know engage in. We have to create more protection for aquatic animals specifically in this kind of a framework as well. And uh, lastly, animals as livelihoods mean balancing human and animal lives. So even if we create the best laws, the thing is, 
if this status stays, we will always value human life over. And a good example of this is actually something that happened in Hurricane Katrina. So there were these evacuation transportations uh, set up, but but the thing was uh, they were only allowed to take the humans. The animals had to be left behind. That was a major reason. And that actually flew from the uh, idea that animals are livelihood. And that will always stay until we change these things, until we change the definitions and how we define those words. And uh, the fourth, and I think this is the most important one, and that's something that's missing. And this actually becomes a reason for creating an animal-specific protection matrix, just as uh, Dr. Glassy mentioned, is that we need to actually look in the domestic framework, like what's the sentient status of, of animals in a particular jurisdiction? There's only very few, but you can imagine if that country has a sentient status, it's going to value that animal at the same level. And if in those situations you create better laws, that will have an effect. They will not be just... Uh, like nice words on paper, they will be actually implemented. And that is something we need to change. Uh, a same case is made for the property status. And I think this is the huge one. This basically makes it okay for having animal husbandry rule practices and keeping uh, animals away, like in times of disasters, like you have to rescue humans first. This needs to change. And uh, then there's these welfare protection status and the environmental protection status. The environmental protection status is basically the presentations Amanda and Beth gave. Um, I personally firmly believe that this framework is a part of disaster frameworks and we have to look at them as a part of it and, and as a map. And, and the same case for welfare protection as well. But the thing is, uh, they will always be meager or not have effect unless we change the first two, which is sentience and property. And and perhaps we actually need to have more of more more things to look at and in these animal statuses. And lastly, the fifth thing is basically animal specific protections in domestic law. For example, Pakistan, uh, animals in zoos we don't have much stronger protection. Same as the case with captivity in farmed animals, it's actually reversed. We give funding. Uh, so in case a disaster happens, we give indemnity funding, and that's the same case in the U.S. as well, which basically gives them no incentive to these farmers to save those animals. So it's anti-disaster framework. It's creating more risk. Uh, same case for companion animals within a specific country, laboratory animals, wild animals, and liminal animals, nobody even thinks about them. But I think if we have more science, uh, they will have a huge role to play as well. And uh, I think an even stronger case for aquatic animals exists. The last thing uh, which I really want to mention is stakeholder accountability. Uh, the thing is, if you violate the Sendai framework, which is just a non-binding resolution, nobody is responsible. And as, as Varnika also mentioned in, in your laws in India, uh, there's no enforcement on paper. A major reason for that is nobody is accountable if there's a violation. That needs to change. Uh, across the board, actually. And and I think this stakeholder accountability part should be a part of that map. Like when we see this disaster prevention, we have to look at the status, we have to look at the reasons why we are creating that law, and so on and so forth. Uh, so my recommendations actually are very simple. Uh, we need an animal-specific disaster protection matrix because every animal is individually uh, affected, and every animal type is individually uh, categorized in domestic frameworks as well, giving us more reason to create these things. Another thing that I recently wrote a paper on is for, and especially coming from an accountability perspective and adding in the biodiversity loss part, an international treaty, which may seem very ambitious, may be needed on animal rescue and international disasters, especially given the biodiversity loss that has happened. Uh, WWF basically reported 69% loss till 2018. But after 2018, we have had major disasters, 3 billion in Australia, 17 million in Brazil, um, and in Pakistan last year, 1 million, and so on and so forth. And the, the disasters that had happened this year, they're not part of the original biodiversity loss that has already happened. So maybe we are at crossroads and we need to change the way we look at things. So I just applied my framework that I created on in Pakistan and uh, we don't have sentient status, animals are property, uh, in welfare protections, it's mostly cruelty. What that really means is in case an animal is hurt or some kind of cruelty happens, then, then there's only stakeholder accountability. There's no positive obligations to protect that animal. And so even if I create like the best disaster management law for Pakistan, we have a na national disaster management act, but there's no mention of animals. It would not work uh, because these things have to be a part of it. 
for environmental protection, Pakistan is signatory to a few treaties like the, the CITES and the CMS, and that creates some protection for endangered animals. But that's also very restricted. We actually need to change that, as, as was clearly mentioned in Beth's and Amanda's presentation. Uh, number five, very important, we don't have, uh, we have weak protection for zoos, captivities, for farm animals. Uh, in Islam, for example, slaughter is regulated, but the thing is, it's not implemented because uh, because there's no actual political will and nobody is accountable. For companion animals, dog culling is a major issue in my country. So with that, uh, how am I expected to create the best disaster protection law and then uh, basically you know, turn it into something that's enforceable? This is important, we need to look at it. And, and lastly, for stakeholder accountability, uh, it's mostly non-existent. Uh, nobody's responsible because uh, that's that's the current framework. And we need to look at all of these things when we are basically defining some kind of a thing. I just wanted to end this on a very positive note. I'll just take three minutes. So there was a flood last year in my country, and we actually went in to rescue both humans and animals. Uh, we provided emergency veterinary aid and over 120,000 kilograms of animal food. Uh, we rescued 8,000 farm animals. At that point, we didn't have a space because... Uh, we couldn't have waited. I mean, those animals would have died for no reason. But this year, we actually got funding from HSI, and we are this close to setting up my country's first disaster uh, zone farm animal shelter. So the 